Hello, I'm uh, Maryam Memar Sadiqi from Tavana, an e-learning institute for Iranian civil society. We're here today with Anne Applebaum. Uh, we're very pleased to have her here. It's a big honor for us. Um, you have uh, probably seen Anne at Tavana before because of her lectures on Putin and Putinism. Um, she generally provided those to us, uh, lectures she had previously given at the London School of Economics. Uh, Anne Applebaum is a um, Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, her book on the Gulag won the Pulitzer Prize. She is a Washington Post columnist, also writes for Slate and the New York Review of Books and, and other places. If that is not enough, she's also the director of the Transitions Forum at Legatum Institute, a, a London-based think tank. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so let's start with uh, a broad question. Um, how did you come to care so much about these people, um, this issue? Uh, in a way, you've been writing about it throughout your career. So what was the, the impetus, uh, the original inspiration to care? Um, you know, there, I don't have any personal connection to this region. Um, it was, it was, I, I, but I studied Russian when I was an undergraduate and when I was studying at university. Um, and that was in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s. And um, even at the time that I was studying, I was aware that things were beginning to change there. And so as a very young journalist, I went mm -hmm. and was based in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in Warsaw when, the, when communism collapsed. Um, and the experience of watching that happen and describing it um, eventually led me back to the question of how it got to be that way in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and my book, Iron Curtain, is an attempt to describe how communism was imposed. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, how a system that was created in the Soviet Union was then imposed on actually what were very different kinds of countries um, with very different histories um, over, you know, in, in actually a very short period of time after the Second World War. Right. So uh, Iron Curtain, which is uh, Anne Applebaum's newest book, uh, has made tremendous uh, waves. Uh, we have translated parts of to Persian, and we are uh, making that available uh, through Anne's generosity, free to anyone for uh, download. And um, so about Iron Curtain, when I first started reading it, I thought, uh, and you, you mentioned this yourself in a way, that Hannah Arendt provides this philosophy or theory of what totalitarian it is, and, but you don't think that that's enough. It, it's important to provide the detail, the lives, the, the particular, to emphasize the particular. And over time, reading it, I realized that it's not just that you're coloring in the lines, the contours, the, providing the, some meat to the, to the bones of Arendt's ar argument. Um, by doing so, you're in fact uh, showing us new faces of totalitarianism and providing a way of understanding totalitarianism that didn't exist before, before you wrote this book. Um, in other words, th through the particular, there's a new uh, way of understanding the, the totality of, of, of this uh, totalitarianism. And it seemed to me that you might have some, some real disagreements in some parts with Arendt even, for example, about collaboration um, and what, uh, what it means to be a collaborator in a totalitarian system. I think you probably have different understandings about that. I mean. Specifically, you seem to show a compassion even towards people who are reluctant collaborators, as you call them. Would you? Would well, you say I, that's true? I would say. I mean, first of all, to be clear about totalitarianism, I mean, the, I describe what it is, and, and you know, it's actually quite simple. It was an it was a attempt by the state to control everything. You know, so not just the economy, not just politics, but also civil society, education, children's after-school activities, the arts, museums, you know, so that there would be no independent institutions at all. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that it ever succeeded. In other words, there aren't, you, can't, you can always give examples of places where it didn't work. Yeah. But that was what, that's what it was supposed to be. Right. Um, you know, and then in the course of writing the book and in the course of interviewing people who lived through that time, which actually, after all, wasn't very long ago, and I, I remember it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, was, I was in both the Soviet Union and Poland um, and the rest el elsewhere uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, interviewing people, you begin to understand that our, our normal understanding of what collaboration means is very simplistic. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you can certainly point to some villains. I mean, you can point to, you know, uh, Stalinist-era prosecutors, and you can point to secret policemen mm -hmm. um, and the Communist Party leaders, particularly in the 50s, who were absolutely cynical and understood that it was purely all about power. Um, but, you know, when you, when you begin to look at, at more ordinary people and how people got along, you know, in a regime where everything is controlled by the state, then there are sometimes ways in which you just have to compromise if you want to make it through the day. You know, if you want your wife to uh, get her medicine from the hospital and you want your children to go to school and you want, you know, very normal, if you want a normal life, mm -hmm. then there are ways in which you have to um, get along with the institutions. And I also understood that, you know, it was possible to sort of be a collaborator in the morning and an opponent in the afternoon. I mean, right. so you could march in the May Day Parade in the morning and then go home in the afternoon and listen to Radio for Europe, which was the independent radio that was coming from, um, coming from the West. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, people had mixed feelings about the state. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they would go along with things because it was easier than, you know, than being opposed to it, or, and, and then they would oppose it when they could. And so there were, people would find opportunities to be in opposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and actually, as the system became weaker, which it did um, in, in Eastern Europe in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, mm -hmm. uh, they took more and more opportunities until eventually, I mean, you know, by the time I went to Poland in the 1980s, it's hard to say that it was really totalitarian. It was, you know, people simply ignored all, all kinds of aspects of the law, and they simply organized their lives themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, it was simply, I, I, I had a more nuanced understanding of what it meant to live in a society like that. And you think that this nuance and this, fo you know, focus on the particular, getting inside of people's lives who were, were ardent believers and uh, chose to close their eyes to some things, but then ultimately would call you and say, no, I did know about that even from the earliest days, and I just wanted you to know that I did well, that, that. was That was an interview I did with a German woman who was a, a German communist, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, or, and a writer, who I had asked her about, uh, and it's actually even more interesting than that, because I had asked her about because in the very first phase of the imposition of communism in East Germany, there were these mass arrests. Mm -hmm. um, and I had asked her about that. Did she know about it? And she said, no, 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 of course not. Um, and then I gave her a copy of a previous book I wrote, which was a history of the gulag, yeah. of the Soviet camp system. And I think mm -hmm. she read the book and decided that you know, I was worth talking to or something. Um, and then she did call me back and said she wanted to tell me again. And actually, her husband was arrested in yeah. that period. Yeah, and then she never remarried. And she didn't remarry. And so she just, she just wanted me to know that she had known. Yeah. Um, she, was, she was very elderly. I mean, she was in her, may even have been in her 90s when I had met her. Were, were these experiences, your research experiences, your interviews in particular, would you say that they gave you a compassion towards collaborators and even ardent supporters of, of communism that you didn't have before and that you don't see in the writings of people like Arendt? Well, Ar Arendt's idea of what communism was was actually quite simplistic. I mean, she's better on Germany than yeah. she is on the Soviet Union um, because she didn't have any personal experience of it. And she also had an idea which then, you know, which was that um, she, she had the idea that people acquired something she called a totalitarian personality. Mm -hmm. You know, that people would buy into the propaganda from yeah. the state, and then that was it. Um, they and would live the lie. And they would live the lie. And that's actually a very unsophisticated understanding of what, how human beings work. I mean, people would sometimes buy into it, but in the back of their heads, they would have doubts about it. Yeah, or so. they would make jokes about it. Or they would, you know, at home, talk to their friends about it. Or they would listen to Radio for Europe. And so mm -hmm. even people who were participating in the yes. system weren't necessarily, didn't necessarily have totalitarian personalities. So this hits very close to home for our audience, because this is just what you described is exactly how it is for people in Iran, and it's, it's recounted in a number of different ways by uh, satirists and, and novelists and others who have either, who, who dared to do so while they were living in Iran more often than not, no, though now they are living outside of the country. Um, a few things that you describe in particular hit close to home. One is a quote by um, this, uh, the satirist, uh, help me with the pronunciation, uh, Jacek Fedorowicz? Jacek yeah, Fedorowicz, yes. Fedorowicz. Uh, he said that the terror was such that one didn't speak of it. And uh, Iranians also, particularly for the first decade or so of the, of the new regime after, after the 79 revolution, the terror was such that, the, the, that one didn't speak of it. Um, the double lives that you describe, you know, people, including him, this guy knowing from a very early age that what, what he said at home couldn't be repeated at school and what he was hearing at school was not 
was not quite right. He knew that at, at a, from a very early age. Um, and people essentially knowing that they must lie in order to survive. They must lie about their real identities. Or the, the fact that there were new winners, that the, that the new regimes created new winners, and that these new winners were, were genuinely empowered to sustain, to keep this system mm -hmm. going. Could you talk a bit about that, the, the new winners? And, and, and you, know, you say that everybody knew somebody who had just gotten in, uh, into the new regime, and through that, through that connection, people would try to uh, better their lives, even if it was just a little bit. How, what, was the, what was the impact of these new winners on sustaining the, the, the terror and the repression? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the, the Soviet system, I mean, deliberately sought to create a kind of new ruling class. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, I mean, and was very open about it. Yeah, you, know, you said that the lowest rungs of society were, all, were, were then the leaders. Yes, they, they, they would, I mean, they reserved jobs and university places according to your social background um, for particular people. Um, and... Uh, they, yeah. you know, and, and you know, even for example, even on a micro level, inside factories, they would promote younger workers over older, more experienced workers, if they were more ideological. Mm -hmm. And so people were promoted and given jobs on the basis of their ideological fanaticism, rather than their ability or their talent. Um, and of course, this worked for a while. I mean, as you say, it, it meant that the people who were in power had a reason to sustain the system yeah. because they because it had made them. Um, on the other hand, in the long term, it was terrible for the society because when you, in any society, when you promote people, for, you know, for, for you know because they're fanatical rather than because they're good, um, then eventually you get a sort of a, 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 a ruling class which is incompetent, and that yes. is what happened. Um, you know, there was sort of joke in communist Poland. You know, that I, I can't, how does it go? I think you you can either be honest. Um, uh, honest and clever. I'm sorry, you can't be both honest and clever and a, and, a, and a communist. I mean, either you're honest and you're stupid, you know, or you're, you know, dishonest and you're clever. I mean, so you, no, nobody who was good and who, and who, you know, was was actually in the leadership. And there became a kind of negative selection, whereby the yeah. the least talented and least gifted and least attractive people became the leaders because they could be relied upon to to not think and to to en enact the orders. Yeah, and, and also over time, you know, people who were clever and who were good at things didn't want to be in the leadership because yes. it was too cynical and it was too stupid. So. Right. And you talk about, you you present a lot of the jokes. It seems like the translation to English is excellent because they're very funny. The jokes that people would tell about the leadership and how over time it 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 became uh, embarrassing for anyone to be associated really with yeah, the Yeah, it was absolutely embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And people would, people would, you know, deny they were associated with leadership if they could, and they would find it very mm -hmm. embarrassing, you know, to have a cousin who was in the party and, you know, so. Again, this really resonates with, with Iran, I, not, not just today, but I think it's probably been now many years where uh, children of, of uh, regime insiders in particular are very embarrassed to, to have it revealed that their, that their fathers are actually uh, part of the part of the government. Um, throughout the book, in, in small ways, you talk about how people, both behind the Iron Curtain, but more significantly, living in the free West, would blame the policies of the West for what was happening, uh, for the repression that was happening behind the Iron Curtain. That I that it was the 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 Cold War rhetoric of the West, or that it was. Uh, not taking advantage of Stalin's peaceful overtures, or um, that by Great Britain, by not uh, allowing um, some people to come in, really, they, it, it was Britain that had an iron curtain around it. But uh, that the that the East was actually uh, free and and such a such an eye-opening alternative to life in the West. Um, could you say? Could you describe that a little bit more for us here? And then also, how much do you see that happening today? in the free world uh, about people who are living in under totalitarian regimes? Um, well, this was a, I mean, I think, I think if I understood your question correctly, what you're talking about is how um, the communist systems used sort of the West as a, as a kind of enemy, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, you know, they would say, you know, they would justify much of what they were doing on the grounds that we are fighting against, a, you know, the fascist, warmongering West and we need to protect ourselves and we need to build up our military and we need to um, protect ourselves against Western ideology and, and, and so on. Um, I mean, it, in, in Eastern Europe, paradoxically, that was probably their biggest mistake because 
it was all too obvious to people who lived in East Germany that mm. um, West Germany was richer and freer and you know, not trying to invade them. Um, and the same was true in other, I mean, because they were so close and because mm -hmm. they had access to Western television and they had access to, they had, you know, quite a lot of information about the West, um, it wasn't a very successful propaganda, mm -hmm. uh, but it is what they use. I think it was probably more successful in the Soviet Union, wh mm -hmm. you know, which was um, throughout much of the 20th century genuinely cut off. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in those days you could cut people off. You could, you could, you know, there was no internet and, you know, there was no, cable right. television, and so people had actually no information yeah. about, about how, how the West worked. Um, uh, nowadays, the, you, know, um, you know, other than Iran, which is a separate and interesting subject, I mean, you have a very similar phenomenon now in Russia, um, where Putin has actually revived this Cold War rhetoric, and mm -hmm. it revived the mm -hmm. use of the West as a, as a military and political opponent. Right, and so, and so what I guess what I, what I was trying to get at is that Putin is doing that, but at the same time, there are people in the West, intellectuals, um, policymakers sometimes, think tank people, who say that if we wouldn't be pushing so hard, if we didn't want to expand NATO the way we did, for example, or if we didn't, yeah. uh, if we didn't say that Iran is part of the axis of evil, then they wouldn't have a reason to be the way they are. It's right. actually our fault. Right. No, no, no. Okay. I, no, no. That, I mean, in the case of Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. you can look at it chronologically. I mean, if you just look at the narrative of what happened at, after the war ended and how the Cold War began, mm -hmm. I mean, just in terms of dates, the repression, the, in fact, the worst repression and the worst era of arrests, murders, um, creation of concentration camps, all happens before the Cold War yeah. begins. So the repression comes first. And then the sort of West reaction comes afterwards, and that's absolutely clear if you look at just the timeline. But you know, it's when did things happen? Isn't it? It's, it's, it, it, it has been historically overlooked. People have, have weren't it weren't paying enough attention to what actually happened in 1945 and 1946 in that region. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at what happened, what were they doing? What did the Red Army do when it arrived? How did it behave? Mm -hmm. Then you see immediately that there was um, that the repression was first. You know, because you know that didn't stop people from, in the, as you say, in the you know the West is a has a there's a phenomenon in the West of the West always looking to blame itself, right? For things that happen that? in other places. How do you explain that? It's it's part of what you have when you have a self-critical culture, a free society. I mean, we just we have an argument, a kind of long-standing arguments about many things, and one of them is about what's our role in the world and what should it be, and is it good or bad, and, um, and you know there are diff there's always different shades of disagreement. Mm -hmm. Um, I, oh, no, and I should also say mm -hmm. there, there is very common um, in the U.S. and Western Europe to, you know, and this is I think probably have also true of most countries, to sort of use, um, you know, when you want to make a criticism of your own society, to use events in a foreign country mm -hmm. as a way of doing it. In other words, so people who have an agenda <laughs> in Washington will also say, well, you know, we're doing X or Y wrong abroad. And it's, it's almost like the... The, you know, what's actually happening abroad isn't really important. What matters is that people are making an argument about, about the U.S. I mean, it's like there used to be people who, in the 80s, I remember, <coughs> there were people who, you know, argue, you know, questioned Reagan's, you know, policy towards the Soviet Union because they didn't like Reagan's domestic policy. Mm. So, um, you know, people don't, people aren't very subtle about, um, about their criticism. Um, you mentioned the role of television, particularly East Germany, being, you know, the experience of, of folks living in East Germany different than the uh, Soviet Union because they, they could see what life was like in West Germany because of, of, of TV. Um, and now, of course, we have the Internet. To what extent do you think, which is, you know, I would argue fundamentally different and, and empowering in, in whole new ways, um, but, of course, you've written also about how the Internet... Um, can just as easily be used by repressive regimes to strengthen their uh, surveillance, repression, and control of society uh, as it can by people seeking to free themselves of that, of that kind of government. Um, do you think that this kind of totalitarian or uh, attempt at totalitarianism is possible even today with the Internet? Um, it's different now. Um, so what I describe is, is what is the 1940s and 1950s. Um, uh, you know, the way in which the Internet can be controlled and manipulated is now, it's actually much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the most, the country which is now the most sophisticated at using the Internet and at using television um, 
to, to transmit disinformation even and to, to, to shape the ways that people think is now Russia, once again. Um, you know, I mean, for, I mean, China also controls the internet in a different way. So, I mean, certainly you can, we know because the Chinese do it, that it's possible to ban topics from the internet and to control what people have access to and what they can and can't see. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, and we also know from the Russian experience that it's possible even to allow people some free access, but manipulate it in terms of how it's interpreted by the mainstream so that, you, so that it's hard to understand. I mean, the, the Russian tactic has been, instead of doing propaganda about Russia and saying, you know, Russia's great, although, you know, the, they, they, mm -hmm. do disinfor they, they try to undermine everything. They, you know, for example, when mm -hmm. the Malaysian plane crashed mm -hmm. in Ukraine last summer, um, the, the, the Russian response um, was to offer 15 different theories. Who could it have possibly been? And they had one, some of them were crazy, some of them were probable, some of them were illogical, but they offered multiple theories so that people would be disoriented. Mm -hmm. um, when in fact, the, the, the people, you know, there's really no doubt that the people who were responsible were shooting using Russian weapons mm -hmm. from Eastern Ukraine. And so it was, it was either a Russian separatist or a Russian, or a Russian army operation. But they offer multiple explanations in order to keep people disoriented. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's another way of manipulating people. When you talk about, um, I think it's in the epilogue, when you talk about Russia today, you say Russia still uses these, these mechanisms and, and these ways of, of controlling dissent. Um, I think that's significant in itself. You, you, you don't say that Russia has reversed uh, the, the, the path towards democracy, or that you, you, you say still, as if there's still in that world of this kind of repression, it's just morphed into something with a new face, perhaps. Well, it's, it's some of the same people. I mean, the, the, the clique of people who control Russia now are almost entirely come from the old KGB. So they're people who are trained, and that's, that's how they think. Mm -hmm. They think very much like secret policemen. Um, what I think is the most interesting um, consistency between the Soviet Union and the present is actually this interest, interest in civil society, in other words, independent organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so the Russian, Russian law yeah. and Russian um, and, and, and practice has been to be very harshly restrict the ability of all kinds of groups, or not political groups, but historical groups and educational groups and um, you know, youth groups and all environmental groups mm -hmm. and to restrict their ability to act freely and independently. And that is very much a Soviet idea. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, you know, that there shouldn't be sources of independent thought or activity in society that aren't somehow directly controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has actually grown and become more um, noticeable even in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been following it, and I've been following um, Anne Applebaum is very active on Twitter. You can follow her on Twitter, and as I mentioned, um, she has a number of wonderful lectures about Putin and Putinism that we have subtitled to Persian, and they're all available on uh, Tevana.org. And, and I, I've told you before, they're they're quite popular through our social through our social networks. One last question: It's about what you do at Legatum, the Transitions Forum. Um, what is the what is the goal there, and how do you work with societies, people people from uh, civil societies in places like Russia and Iran? Um, we have a you know we're a very actually very small organization, but we you know I'm interested in understanding how um, how political change happens um, mm -hmm. or doesn't, um, and we've done a number of different projects in different countries. Um, we did actually do a series of. Uh, conferences on Iran, yes. at which you came to one of them, mm -hmm. um, which were designed to look at, to, to, to get Iranians thinking about, um, uh, simply to get people thinking about a different future. Yeah. In other words, not to focus on the present and what's wrong with the present, of course, you know, that's, that's of course important to do, you know, or how but to... we do plenty of it. <laughs> exactly, or how to, how to you know, and, and the idea was to not focus on, you know, I don't know, the revolution or the transition or whatever it's going to be, but, you know, if at some point you could have a different kind of Iran, mm -hmm. what would the problem, even if you had a different government, right. any kind of government, what would the problems be? Yeah. What would the issues be? And we did one on education, and we did one on um, justice and judicial reform, and we did one on the economy. Mm -hmm. Um, and we published a series of papers connected to each one of those, which are yeah. actually on our website, yes. the Legatum website. Legatum Institute. So it's forward-looking, right? We, we tr we've done some projects that are, sometimes we analyze the past, why did something work or not work, and sometimes we try to get people to throw, look at the problem, mm. you know, look at the problem of, um, you know, in Iran, the judiciary, 
um, if you wanted a different kind of judiciary, what would you have to do? How could you do? How could you retrain judges? How could you think about that? And and make people focus on 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 those kinds of things. Okay, Anne Applebaum, thank you again. Her book Iron Curtain in abridged form is available for free download. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.